organizations reflect that mosaic? Do our organizations reflect the melting pot? If it doesn't, we have a lot of work to do. Does the mosaic really bring to life the organizational change that is needed to make sure that everyone is included, that everyone is made to feel apart? And that really is the bottom line. My title, and it's a long one, so I forgive people who call it something else. Sometimes I get a promotion, I become the vice president, and then sometimes uh, a little bit lower status. But equity, diversity, and inclusion is a part of my title for a significant reason. Those three principles, those three values, are the concepts that are needed to make this diversity thing work. When I think about equity, equity is simply the fair and just treatment of various individuals. And in paying attention to our various histories, whether it's in the US or in Canada, equity speaks to addressing those particular inequities. But then we have diversity, which is difference, and reflected in the slide here. Simply difference. And difference can be a wonderful, transformative thing if we allow it to be. And then there is inclusion. Inclusion, for me, is where the real work really begins. Because that's where you are very intentional, very actualized in making sure that equity, as well as diversity, matters within your organizations. Just not on a superficial level, but integrated throughout the organization. The charge that I have as the Chief Diversity Officer at Ryerson is to integrate EDI, as we call it, into the entire organization. Now, if you know anything about running universities, it's very difficult to make faculty do some things. It's like herding cats. And I actually used to be faculty, so I know what that's like. It's, it's nice to have your autonomy. But in all of our different organizations, we have specific challenges based on the type of employees we have, based on the structure of the organization, and it behooves us to figure out those various ways to make inclusion work and to make it matter. So all of us are very much attuned to the business case. And I subscribe to the business case as well. It's about the bottom line. It's about tapping the workforce. It's about having an optimal organization as well as branching off into new markets. However, there are other reasons why diversity matter that buttress that diversity, excuse me, uh, that business case for diversity. I would say the moral argument is an argument that has been lost, and we need to reclaim it and bring it back into the discussion. But along with that, the demographic imperative really is where it starts. Because of the changing demographics, not only in the US, but definitely here, as was described earlier, specifically in Ontario. In the US, the growing, the fastest growing population uh, is Hispanics. In Canada, from what I've been made aware, is Aboriginal people. So are our, our organizations preparing for that? looking at that information, using it so that it can benefit our workforce as well as benefit our organization. Of course, there is the human rights, the social justice. I would say human rights seems to be more of an emphasis here in Canada, whereas social justice seems to be more of an emphasis in the U.S., but it's still somewhat cut from the same cloth. Then you have what I would call the education imperative, the education argument. 
And the reason why I bring this forward is a few years ago, several universities were sued because they were taking advantage of having race conscious policies for admissions, scholarships, etc. They were sued. It went through the entire court system, all the way through to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the argument that the institution made was the educational argument. The educational argument basically speaks to citizenship. It speaks to universities having a dominant role in graduating qualified, diverse, diverse graduates who can serve in government, serve as leaders across the board, whether it's the military, other areas of government, definitely business and other sectors are important. And what's very interesting is that for this particular case, Fortune 500 companies weighed in, former presidents weighed in, different higher ed associations weighed in, to basically say that diversity is a compelling interest, not only because of the bottom line, but because we need it for a diverse democracy. Future generations out really should look at this and say, what was he talking about? I have no clue, but I do have a clue. And it's unfortunate that I would say in the US that this is such a, a dominant aspect of American life. But, and excuse me, struggling with a little cold here. But when I came here, um, the African American and American part really stuck out like a sore thumb. <laughs> You know, I never really, really thought about being an American. It, I just am. But, but when I got here, people reminded me of that. <laughs> I would get questions like, so, where are you from? <laughs> you don't sound Canadian, eh? <laughs> and you don't sound Jamaican. <laughs> and I guess my accent would just give myself away. Uh, but it, it helped me to engage in very polite conversation with, did someone pick up on the polite? <laughs> engage in polite conversation with individuals here who I would say really did want to know who I was, what I was doing here, what I'm about. That's, that's a wonderful thing, to, to have that kind of exchange. And I do, even though I'm not a citizen, I'm an immigrant, on the work permit, working on it though, <laughs> um, it, there's a freeness that I feel living here that I, I would say is very wonderful, that I haven't had in a long time um, in living back home. So that takes us to the conversation. The conversations do start with those type of questions. And what I've learned from talking with colleagues here is that they're individuals who've been here for generations. Matter of fact, they're not immigrants from another place. They are born and bred Canadian, but they get questions as to where are you from? No, where are you from, really? <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell that some of you have experienced that, possibly. So I'm here, and I'm translating. Lived in the US, done diversity work, affirmative action, diversity, LGBT, AODA, all those different things are swirling in my mind. And then when I get here, there's other terminology to become accustomed with. Visible minority? Still working on that. <laughs> um, 
I usually say people of color. I, the terminology just is difficult to deal with on either side of the border. But we have to start the conversation some way, somehow. Unfortunately, back home, your neighbor down south, I think race has become a very paralyzing conversation. Paralyzing such that even our president, who is truly African American, can't freely speak to those issues. But that is where the conversation starts. That is where people's training begins. At the point of even, even worse than that, the black-white dialogue versus integrating other aspects of that. Now that's not to say the LGBTQ or disability community or other areas aren't acknowledge from one point to another, but the conversation typically starts with race. So when I got here, I had to change my lens because it doesn't start with race. It starts in multiple spaces. The optimal chief diversity officer position from my standpoint, given my experience both in the U.S. and here, is that that person should be a part of the C-suite. But if not, definitely a senior executive at the senior level in the organization. Ryerson, to their credit, they started this position at the top. I report to two vice presidents. That's an interesting role to have, reporting to two people. But I report to two vice presidents and it gives me the opportunity to begin to infuse EDI into the academic side of the house as well as the administrative side of the house. I found in coming here that people tried to put me into an HR box. And I had to let them know, I'm not the HR specialist. That is not what this is about. This is about strategic change, organizational change, transformation of the organization, and going back to what I said earlier, the melting pot or the mosaic, to make that a reality within our organizations. So being a part of the C-suite, in order so that person or persons can address the organization's policies, practices, while providing leadership across all levels, of the organization. And actually in the U.S., these positions are framed in such a way that a person in my role could actually move to a president's position. There are chief diversity officers back home who started at a particular position and because their role required them to understand the entire organization, it primed them for mobility upward. So consider, consider that. Certainly the change agent and also the strategist. Going back to the question, how do you do that? Strategy is a part of it. Looking at the demographics, developing a strategic plan, coming up with measurable goals, holding people accountable making sure that everyone who reports to the president has EDI within their portfolio. And they have to be held accounted, accountable for that at each performance review or, or however way that's, that's framed. In organizational change, is colorblindness the goal? Colorblindness is a nice term. It's a term to signal that I don't pay attention to those things. That's not part of how I see you. But if we consider it, and, and I get that, I do get that. 
But in considering colorblindness from just a natural physical perspective, you see up here two numbers, possibly. I'm somewhat visually challenged, so I have to squint here or there to see things. The 12 and 45, you can see those numbers. Why not? What is wrong with being able to see fully and to incorporate what you see into what needs to happen to change your organizations? You don't want to miss anything, especially being a strategist. Colorblindness, I believe, allows us a pass. A pass in a way that is not intentional, but we miss out on tapping all of that potential, tapping the diversity in the workforce, because we subscribe to a, a philosophy, to a particular value that may not be as helpful as we need it to be. Well, being intentional is extremely important. And intentionality has to be incorporated into, again, a strategic plan, policies, practices, accountability, resources. <laughs> Ultimately, the resources. The resources determine what the values are because the resources are directed towards those various efforts. And again, I think our corporate partners, our corporate friends, do a much better job at that, can certainly do better, but do a much better job at that than in the higher ed sector. And so I'll conclude with a quote from Aristotle. Excellence is never an accident. It is always the result of high intentions, sincere effort, and intelligent execution. Thank you.